Despite being almost two entirely separate games from a conceptual standpoint, solo queue and professional play are inextricably linked to each other whether they should be or not. While other esports titles have a similar dynamic between casual and competitive, they usually conduct their own affairs mutually exclusive from each other or directly correlated with each other. That is, they mind their own business, and matters from one side don't really affect the other, or there's not that much of a difference between their environments. League of Legends could not be any more different. Champion Balance is heavily influenced by the landscape of solo queue and pro play alike. Whenever someone is overperforming relative to pick and ban rate, they're most certainly on the balance team's radar for nerfs. At the time of writing this video, we're at the tail end of version 12.12, .12, which means you guys might see this around late July, so you're probably in 12.14 already. Anyways, Volibear has been dominating in all ELOs by serious margin, 54% plus win rate with a double digit pick and ban rate. That's how balance usually works, in solo queue at least. If a champion breaks past the accepted 48-52% to win rate boundary from Iron and Bronze all the way to Grandmaster and Challenger, the balance team will use whatever means necessary to push them back down. What about the opposite end of the spectrum, the 47, 46, and 45% win rate champions? Why are they getting the reverse treatment? That's what we're going to explore in this episode. For today, I want to go over the champions that are always weak, why they keep getting nerfed even though they're already worse than average, and how pro play ties into all of this. Before we continue, a word from today's sponsor, Factor. You know the drill, no playing on an empty stomach, so might as well make it healthy. Factor is a meal prep service that delivers right to your door. The meals arrive pre-prepared and ready to eat within 2 minutes or less, and you have a ton of options to choose from, so if you're doing keto, trying to lose weight, or following a vegetarian or vegan lifestyle, they have everything for you. They boast a really extensive menu with a minimum of 27 meal options and 33 add-ons like smoothies, shakes and desserts, and more at a time. Factor prides themselves on catering to every customer's individual lifestyle by letting them decide how many meals they want per week, if they feel like skipping a week, any specific food preferences or allergies, so on and so forth. I myself order a lot of meal preps since I'm too busy to cook most of the time, and Factor is a good way to maintain a healthy lifestyle. It's a really handy service for those of you who still want to eat good food even if you can't find the time or energy to cook. So if you're interested, head on over to go.factor75.com and use the code POGVARS130, which is also in the description, and you'll get $130 off across 6 boxes. Thanks again to Factor for sponsoring the video, but for now, let's get back into it. I feel like I should clarify the thought process that goes into balancing champions in light of how ambiguous they really are. The video title says always weak, implying these champions are bad and should never be worth using. It should go without saying that win rate isn't the be all end all in determining one's viability. Granted, it matters. If someone has a 47% win rate, that means on average, they will only win 47 games out of 100. Assuming normal MMR, 6 losses equates to just around 100 LP, a full division. Conversely, a 54% win rate champion wins on average 54 games out of 100. 8 net wins is a lot of LP. That being said, there are an endless number of factors that contribute to a champion's performative metrics. A major one is their pick and ban rate. Historically, there's always been a small group of cast members who would routinely hover around the 53-55% win rate, which ordinarily would be too high up. However, the group consists of champions with sparse representation. Aurelian Soul, Quinn, Skarner, the why no one plays characters. It should go without saying that the only ones who play them are the ones who really want to play them. Naturally, that means they're well studied on the champion, and the lack of matchup experience from their opponents would give them a sizable advantage. By consequence, that would lead to an above average performance. Champions like Lee Sin, Yasuo, and Viego average poor win rates due to how popular they are. Players are more likely to first time Irelia when autofill Ben singed, resulting in many losses that weigh against her stats. Obviously, first timers have no idea what the hell they're doing, so they'll make the champion look bad. But that doesn't mean the champions themselves are bad. As they say, it's not the car, it's the driver, not the weapon, it's the wielder. The higher someone's pick rate is, the more likely a bunch of noobs are for funding them, thus tanking said win rate. The second would be their situations. The champion in question might be very strong on paper, but not a wise choice at the present moment in light of external circumstances. Either the matchups that counter them are also very strong, or they're stifled by their items being underpowered. This happens all the time. Mordekaiser in top lane has been hard stuck 47% in time and plus for years at this point, and received a million buffs to where he's extremely overtuned now, but his numbers weren't changing because all of his counters were overpowered for so long. Irelia, Jax, Viora, Gwen, Yone, Trindemir, Gangplank, since then they've all gotten nerfed though, and what do you know, Mordekaiser's win rate jumped to 50% pretty much overnight. Individual circumstances play their own roles for a champion, but win rates are ultimately just numbers with no grounds behind them. Context matters. Be that as it may, those numbers are still an indication of their relative position in the meta. But there is one other factor with a lot of controlling equity in this matter, their presence in pro play, which I suppose is an extension of pick and ban rate. Given that LCS, LEC, LCK, LPL and such are an organized team of 5 with communications versus another organized team of 5 with communications, priorities are different. Solo queue mentality generally incentivizes players to field champions with a greater focus on self-sufficiency. 
Big Sec can take best advantage of the inherent absence of coordination from both their own team and the enemies. That's why you almost never see the likes of Yorick in pro play. While it's true that split pushing becomes more effective if you're able to communicate with your team, it's also less effective if the enemy team is able to communicate as well, since it capitalizes on disorganization and poor macro. Pro play values different things in a champion. Above all else, they want consistency and stability. Let's take a look at a few traditionally popular picks. A good place to start would be Renekton. In solo queue, Renekton has always been a staple for many top laners. He's easy to learn, very effective in the early game, has more or less a decent matchup spread, and is very consistent on paper. But for most of his career, his win rate has never gone above 50%, usually staying around 47 to 49, and it's no surprise why. He's the lane bully, strong early game that gradually tapers off over time. For all intents and purposes, Renekton is a weak champion, yet even though his solo queue performance was below average, for most of seasons 10 and 11, Renekton was extremely popular in pro play. Compiling statistics from season 11 in all major regions, Renekton commanded the second highest presence at 63%, a full 13% above third place, and his win rate held at 51. In Season 10, he was in 11th place with a 43% presence and a 53% win rate. His dominance in the pro meta stemmed from how he basically guarantees priority in top lane. As mentioned before, Renekton's matchup spread is very comfortable, emphasized even more so by the fact that whoever counters him hard is not worth using in pro play. Lane priority is extremely important since it allows the rest of your team more freedom to make plays around the map. Your jungler might feel more confident in doing Rift Herald or Baron if they don't have to worry about the enemy laners rotating to contest, and usually they can't if they're pushed under tower by their own laners. Furthermore, tower diving on him was brain dead easy, still is. Renekton can easily shove top lane under his opponent's tower, then with his ultimate allowing him to tank effectively one or two extra tower shots and a point and click 1.5 seconds done, easy dive, easy rift held, so on and so forth. Towards the mid to late game, his effectiveness would diminish, but if played correctly, he would have gotten his team far enough ahead to where that wouldn't matter. Plus, he still had enough stats and items to frontline for his team and lock down a priority target. As a result, Riot went after the parts of his kit that affected his ability to win lane priority in the early game and frontline for his team in the mid game. They started by slashing the heal on his Q in half essentially, preventing him from maintaining a healthy amount of HP for those tower dies. Then they lowered the health bonus from Dominus by 100 at rank 2 and 200 at rank 3. These changes may not seem like much, but considering what Renekton's job was in pro play, trust me when I say that mattered a lot. In solo queue, his goal was more or less the same, win early game then carry his team through sheer brute force. The nerfs to him in his core build ultimately crippled the poor guy to where even in the early game he loses a lot of matchups that he used to win. Nowadays, most of the time, picking Renekton is too risky, and he was already kind of a risk even before those nerfs. Another good example would be Jace, a very familiar face in the pro scene. In a similar fashion to Renekton, Jace is a strong pick on account of how safe and reliable he is, for different reasons of course. Once again, Chase is a strong laning phase. Strong laning phase means higher chance of establishing lane priority, and lane priority means higher chance of controlling the map entering mid game. However, Chase's neutral game is why pro players like him so much. He's a champion with a very strong burst rotation thanks to his incredible damage scaling with items, but pro play often has way more protracted neutral exchanges, as teams are not as trigger happy for skirmishes and team fights unless absolutely necessary. Even to this day, Shock Blast in tandem with Acceleration Gate is one of the most terrifying projectiles in the game. It has a max target range of 1600 units, an explosion radius of 250, and 462 base plus 168% bonus AD physical damage. You need only 3 items to start dealing almost a grand with each shot. Not to mention, it can strike multiple targets. Chase's flexibility, he can go full aggro one-shot mode or he can sit back and provide cover fire for his team with his long-range pressure. That and Acceleration Gate helps out with rotations. Conceptually speaking, he does fall off, but not by enough to offset how much he brings to the table. You can feed your ass off early game and still have enough damage to one-shot the enemy backline with just Eclipse and Muramana. You have to respect his damage no matter what, attesting to his consistently high presence. So in an effort to add more risk to his early game and make him more punishable, the balance team would often target his base numbers, low base health, low armor, low base attack damage, low base ability damage, and then funnel them into better scaling and stack growth. Except, Chase's performance in the early game is what determines how well he performs in the mid to late game, hence why in solo queue his win rate is much worse. He's virtually always in the bottom 10 no matter if he's top or mid lane. Several others with the high presence in pro play are also given the same balance treatment. You have champions like Syndra, Azir, Ryze, LeBlanc, Aphelios, Jarvan with garbage ass 45-47% win rates who are unable to get the buffs they need to be usable purely because a 1-2% win rate boost in solo queue equates to a 5% boost in pro play and a 100% pick ban presence over night. Is every bad win rate champion a victim of pro play? No, not always. But there's no denying that balance changes are influenced in some way shape or form by their presence in pro play. 
Patch 12.13 is bringing a considerable nerf to Corgi's neutral game pressure despite already sitting at a 47-48% win rate. The only reason they're doing this is because he's still being used a lot in pro play. Since the point of balance begins at the top of the pyramid then works his way down, champions that would be fantastic choices in solo queue hardly ever get the opportunity as their potential of maximum efficiency is too good for them to be allowed a wider margin for error, which is essentially what this whole arrangement boils down to. Every champion has a pressure floor and ceiling. The floor is the bare minimum you can reasonably expect from them when piloted by the worst players, not counting intent feeding of course. The ceiling is the absolute maximum they're capable of achieving when piloted by the best of the best. This range of output lays the foundation for the amount of margin for error a champion is given. Let's use Garen as an example, one of League's easiest champions to play. His passive, Regeneration Out of Combat, his Q, Movement Speed, and his next auto does more damage and silences, W is bonus armor and magic resist, and then his shield and damage reduction with tenacity, his E is a copyright infringement of Beyblade, his ultimate, point and click, someone dies. Since Garen doesn't really fluctuate a whole lot from situation to situation, his pressure ceiling doesn't reach very high. For the sake of argument, let's give him an arbitrary number of 120%. But that also means his pressure floor doesn't fall too low either, because there's almost no way you can mess with Garen's mechanics. In other words, he chills between 80 to 120%. You can rely on him to not be utterly useless, but you also won't get the best return on your time. On the other hand, we have someone like Azir, one of the most difficult champions to play, if not the most difficult period. To get the hang of him, you need a minimum of 100 games on Azir. But the more and more time you spend, the more and more you can do with the guy. He has DPS, mobility, zone control, neutral game, teamfight pressure, dueling potential, engage, sieging capability, AoE damage, single target damage. Azir has everything you can think of, so his range of pressure would be more like 20% to 180%. If you don't know what you're doing, he's garbage. If you do know what you're doing, Azir is hyper carry material. Professional play features the creme de la creme of League of Legends, the best players with the best macro, the best game knowledge, and the best mechanics. The top 0.001% of the however many millions of players in this game. Their individual skill, alongside the added support of team synergy and communications, form the perfect environment for tapping into the absolute limits of a champion, or the perfect environment for making the most out of the strengths of a champion. I'm not trying to say Renekton, LeBlanc, or Jace have pressure ceilings of 180%, it's just what they can do for the team is best applied in coordinated matches rather than in chaos of solo queue. As for the others, Azir, Syndra, Ryze, Aphelios, they very much appreciate the extra legroom. Sadly, whether you're from the first or second group, you're treated all the same in regards to solo queue. The more efficiently they can be used in pro play, the less number of excusable mistakes they can make. In solo queue, mistakes and random BS happen all the time, but with how those champions are balanced and not allow for that many, pragmatically speaking, they're just not viable. In the past, I've weighed the importance of both pro play and solo queue, and while I still believe solo queue carries more equity, trying to accommodate only one is just not an option. Solo queue is the fundamental experience of League, it's where 99.9999% of meaningful games take place. Sorry to say it, but blind pick norms don't affect balance. So it makes perfect sense for balance to follow the beat of solo queue seeing as it has the biggest sample size and varying skill levels. Therefore, you can figure out if a champion truly deserves a buff or nerf. There are tens of thousands of Arden fans for each of the always weak champions that are probably not enjoying the game very much due to receiving no attention while everyone else is. Conversely, while pro play is only made up of maybe 2 to 300 players and only a few thousand games per year, it's a huge source of exposure, revenue, and commercial activity. Part of why League has become such a cultural phenomenon in the gaming industry is because of things like LCS, LEC, LCK, LPL, MSI, and the World Championship. These high profile events bring in the spectators, they bring in new players, they bring in sponsors, they bring in money. It doesn't matter if you are or aren't involved in the pro scene, it plays an integral role in the success of League. It plays an integral role in the success of any esport. The Super Smash Bros franchise has always been regarded as a casual party game by the greater Nintendo community and Nintendo themselves, but Smash 4 and Smash Ultimate have still received a myriad of balance patches to better adjust the game for pro play since, no matter how much Nintendo tries to disavow it, Smash Bros is an esport and esports bring in tons of new players. More players, more money. So in a tragic yet inevitable way, always weak champions are in essence reserved only for pro play. That's not to say you'll find no success playing Syndra or Chase in solo queue. You definitely can, and many do. You just have to be aware that the balance team will more likely than not be on the side against you, not on the side with you. Fortunately, Riot is taking the issue of exclusivity into consideration. They themselves have admitted it's not a good thing for a champion's presence in solo queue to be so harshly and negatively affected by pro play, and usually roll out gameplay updates that shift around their power budget so as to lower their pressure ceiling in exchange for raising the floor. A good example of this is Rek'Sai. She used to rampage the pro scene like No Tomorrow from seasons 5 through 7, but after they changed her to be more damage oriented, she's a champion more suited for solo queue than pro play. Although with still a few issues, but I mean it's better than nothing. 
Anyways, what are your thoughts on the so-called always weak champions? Do you think there's a possible win-win situation for them, or are they forever going to stay the same way? Feel free to share in the comments. That's it for today though, so if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to leave a like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, at Varisverum, join my Discord server, and check out my other champion group discussions if you haven't yet. But until next time, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.